I have to tell you that there are many gifts that everybody gets in this life. And Ashley got music gift in the Dimmick family. And so when I knew I was going to speak here, I knew exactly the song that I wanted to be sung here. And, and thank you, Ashley, and to our son-in-law, Beto, for being here today. President Dimmick mentioned that uh, we just completed serving a mission in the Washington Spokane Mission. Well, after a few weeks of driving around the scenic Northwest, and it was beautiful, right, sisters? Uh, we have some of our missionaries here today. I turned to President Dimmick and I said, hey, this is like a three-year date with 200 missionaries in the back seat. <laughs> And that's just what it was. But by the time we finished our mission, our car had morphed into this mega bus, and now we had 500 missionaries in the back seat. And let me tell you, it was a ride. It was a ride of a lifetime. Um, we love our missionaries, and we love the great work that, um, that goes on in sharing the gospel. Um, Looking out at you today, I kind of feel like we're in an extended extra large mega zone conference, so you're just not dressed in suits and dresses. Uh, how we love the youth of the church, how grateful we are for um, the privilege to work with you. Martin Luther, one of the great early Christian reformers said, the kingdom of God is like a besieged city surrounded on all sides by death. Each man, woman, and child has their place on the wall to defend, and no one can stand where another stands. But nothing keeps us from calling out encouragement to one another. Today, I am here to call out encouragement to you young adults and to some of you who are not so young. This mighty generation you are called to prepare the world for the second coming of the Savior, and I testify it will come. It is coming soon. And the unprecedented growth and change we are seeing by living prophets today are all an indication that it's time to be ready. Today, I'm also going to call out encouragement about mental health. And I am here to break stigmas of guilt and shame around these issues. I want to create an open space of understanding and present open flow for dialogue and conversation. You may not struggle with emotional health, but surely you know someone who does. The word enthusiasm is formed from two root words, en meaning in, and theo meaning God. So when you have enthusiasm, literally it means having a God within, also known as the Holy Ghost. So let's roll up our sleeves and take this into enthusiasm to discuss mental health issues. Aren't you so excited to talk about depression and anxiety? <laughs> As I um, raised our children and then went back to school, I was directed to this field. And sometimes I thought, and why would I get a job to listen to people talk about how sad and depressed and <laughs> hopeless they felt? Uh, but that's why I'm here, because there is hope. There are answers. Some thorns in the flesh we carry throughout our lives, such as my case. I probably will never be free completely from mental illness, but I do testify with all my heart that when you turn to a higher power and you are determined to do what it takes, you can experience happiness and joy. Well, um, President Dimmick and I met here at Utah State and I loved how Elder Gary Stevenson mentioned the other day some Aggie memories, and it caused some memories of my own. President Dimmick and I met about 500 yards down Darwin Avenue, and he had just, as he said, come home from a mission. And yes, in high school, I dated Blaine. No, no, I dated <laughs> Dane and Zane. And then I came to Utah State, and I dated Blaine, and then I married Wayne. True statement. <laughs> but one of these memories that occurred on Darwin Avenue, just almost across the street from this building, was in my apartment. And I walked down the hall one day to see one of my roommates in her room. She looked so forlorn, so lost. So I sat and talked with her for a few minutes, and she described her depression. She said, sometimes I feel so hopeless 
that I feel like taking my own life. And there I was with 19 years of very little experience. And I honestly did not, not know what to say to her. Oh, I tried to give her encouragement and I expressed my love. But I recognized this was something so much bigger than I knew how to deal with at that age. I wish I could go back to that scene on Darwin Avenue and put my arms around my roommate. She did not take her life, but I could see in her eyes the pain she felt. Little did I know at age 19 how my own personal journey with depression and anxiety uh, would unfold. Some seven years later and after our third child was born, I experienced my first round of depression. But Jet, that was just the pre-show to the real issue two years later after our daughter Ashley was born. We lived in Portland, Oregon, and yes, it was rainy and cloudy and overcast, and it matched the mood <laughs> that came upon me. Um, we were running our lives full steam ahead. President uh, was teaching early morning seminary and then full-time seminary all day, was on the high school, and also started grad school that semester. I was primary president. We had four children under the age of eight. Does this sound like a recipe for disaster? And our two-year-old was the cutest, blonde, blue-eyed boy with the Dennis the Menace personality. Look up the movie if you haven't seen it. This twinkle in his eye left me never knowing what was going to happen next. And now he's married and has a little boy just like it. Yes! <laughs> um, I never saw what was coming, though. I was running my life as a perfectionist. That primary had to be perfect, even those 11-year-old scouts. That's an impossible task, by the way, I learned. I pushed past every warning signal that I was in distress. Then one day, I literally collapsed on the stairs in our home with some of the most terrifying symptoms I had never seen anybody have, and I thought I was dying. As you can see, I didn't. <laughs> Um, the president rushed me to the hospital. And after a thorough examination, I can still remember my release papers from the hospital that day, and scribbled across it in big words was the word depression. And I said, oh, absolutely not. That is not me. People with depression cannot function. They don't get out of bed, and they forget to eat. And I've never forgotten to eat in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> and so began a lifetime of managing mental health. I would like to say that I got better fast, but I didn't. Um, it was a long, it has been a long road. And that's why I can talk to you about it today. Over the past 33 years, depression and anxiety have had a way of kind of hanging around and even when I banish them to outer darkness, they book flights and they end up on my doorstep again. Sometimes I've sworn at them, but then I have to repent. So I fought, I resisted, I denied, and finally I accepted. Through genetic and life conditions, depression was on my plate. And what a power tutor these illnesses have been for me. Brothers and sisters, we all have something difficult in our lives, don't we? In fact, one of the greatest missionaries of all time, the Apostle Paul, had an unknown affliction, which he described as his thorn in the flesh. Even though he had witnessed marvelous visions, he said, and lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given, uh, excuse me, Although I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And then listen to what Paul says. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might be depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, I bet in your worst days, you don't glory in your weakness or in your infirmity. Do you whine and complain like I have? Okay, well, welcome to the mortal race. Okay, we're not perfect. We don't handle 
life's adversities perfectly all the time, do we? But listen to what Paul says next. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Can you imagine reaching a deep, humble point of true submission where you can come boldly unto the throne of grace to help with your infirmities and your weaknesses, your thorn of flesh, especially those things which are not removed in mortality. Christ promises that when we do this, we can obtain mercy to help and have grace in time of need. Think for a minute about your thorn in the flesh. Maybe it's finances, relationship challenges, dating or not dating, addiction, loneliness, same gender attraction, physical health, death, lacking social skills, pornography, learning disabilities, divorce, bullying, abuse, and the list goes on. Oh, how we need help to make it through. And by the way, um, I'm now a therapist and I've seen every one of those come across my office. Speaking of thorns in the flesh, um, my daughter and her husband um, are living with us right now. Ashley and Beto met in Mexico City when she was doing research for BYU. I know, that other university. They fell in love, married, lived there several years, had their first baby. They immigrated to the United States here a little while ago. And last June, exactly a week before we came home from our mission, uh, Beto was having an amazing adventure at Deer Valley mountain biking. Took a bad fall. Broke his femur, his clavicle, and was rushed to the emergency room. The next morning, President Dimmick and I were in, or in Washington giving our kind of farewell speech for our mission in our ward. And we received a call saying that his condition has, had worsened. Um, Beto was having seizures and fell into a deep coma for over two weeks. We didn't know if he would ever recover from that coma. We didn't know if he'd ever wake up, if he would ever walk again, if he could ever talk, if he would recognize his wife or little boy, or if he would ever know or remember that they were expecting their second child. It's been a long seven months. I stand before you. Testify that God is a God of miracles. The day he flicked his right finger was one of the happiest days of our lives. And then he fluttered his eyelids. And eventually he woke up and he has worked really hard. He's been to multiple types of therapists, occupational, physical, speech therapists. And Ashley posted on Facebook the day that he ran on the treadmill. Is this a thorn in the flesh? Yes. Several weeks ago, after much labor and really cool occupational therapy where he did driving simulation in a, in a building with cars and signals coming at him and measuring his reaction time, Beto has his driver's license. And just this week after extensive neuropsychiatric evaluation, he was cleared to go back to his work as a veterinarian. 
Brothers and sisters, we worship a God of miracles. They're not out of the forest. They have a long road ahead. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only way that we make it through. Now let's talk about some practical things. Uh, first, I want to just twist um, a little bit on this new focus that the church has on ministering. Um, love it. But I submit that the very first person that you need to minister to is yourself. We understand from Doctrine and Covenants 18 that the worth of souls is great in the sight of God and that if we labor all our days and bring, save it be, one soul to him, how great will be our joy. I submit that one soul, the first soul you must bring back to heaven is yourself. That is part of self-reliance. Self-care is not self-centeredness. It is not selfish. It is essential, especially with all the pressure you have in your lives right now. You cannot pour from an empty cup. You cannot give what you don't have. It is that algebraic equation, the order of operations. And yes, I survived every math class by living in that math tutoring lab at the student center. Algebraic equation, order of operations says first things first. You are the first thing. When you minister properly to yourself, you are responsible for every area of your well-being you become an invaluable resource to the kingdom of God. A critical part of self-care is your emotional and mental well-being, for that imparts, impacts every other part of health. So let's talk about that five-letter word, stress. Anybody have stress today? Anybody have stress this afternoon, this weekend, a date coming up, or they turned you down, or she said no, or that's a lot of stress. <laughs> Our mental health is related to how we, have, how we handle stress. And sometimes stress gets a bad rap. So let's clarify two types of stress. U stress, spelled E-U stress, S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -S, is a positive motivating stress that gets you moving. It gets you up out of your seat and taking action. It's the feeling I had all morning that I was going to give this, test, this talk today. Uh, I actually wanted to do the flight fighter freeze thing that I was just going to take off and run, but I'm here. Um, there's a wonderful TED talk, and I suggested it. it's called How to Make Stress Your Friend. The author states that that feeling of stress, that knot in your stomach, is the body and mind preparing to perform. So rather than getting stressed about it, you say to yourself, this is the most awesome feeling in the world, and I am going to nail it. I'm going to kiss the girl tonight. That's it. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's a good thing. Now the net, but don't kiss on the first date. Okay, let warm up. I mean, well, I'm not. I'm not going to go there. Okay. <laughs> the flip side of that is distress, when we're on overload, drained, and exhausted. Elder Holland calls it depletion, depression. He encourages to watch all of those warning signs, those signals like a car dashboard that says low on gas, temperatures rising. He said, so rest up, refuel, re-engage, take a break, talk to a friend, go for a walk, get fresh air. Raise your hand if you have been up Logan Canyon since you've been a student. Okay, take a look around. Okay, the rest of you, will you please repent? It's absolutely gorgeous. Even when it's cold, if you don't like the snow, it's beautiful in every season. Five minutes, I used to run from here up there. You could be the first dam. As slow as I went, you could make it in 10 minutes. You fast runners, you could make it in five. Get out, breathe, enjoy. Remove yourself from technology. Find things that are real. We live in a virtual reality that is not reality. Whatever it is that you can connect to breathing, moving, living, growing things that will help you manage your stress. Now left unattended, distress can evolve into mental illness. What we are talking about here is more than a bad hair day or test stress or paper deadlines. We're talking about an illness so profound that it impairs functioning, it damages relationships, and yes, 
an illness that can be fatal. The good news is there's help. If you are or have been in this boat, you are in good company. Have you ever heard of people like Abraham Lincoln, Sir Winston Churchill, First Lady Betty Ford, an author by the name of J.K. Rowling? You might have heard of her. And even our beloved Jeffrey R. Holland. All those suffered from depression, and maybe some still do. Okay, not Lincoln. <laughs> These people all manage the thorn in the flesh and manage to contribute greatly to humanity and to history. I want you to know that it is a lie. It is a lie that you cannot get over or deal with or manage your mental illness. And I am no stranger to the full gamut of them. It may never go away, but it is your responsibility to face it, and to get the help you need. We don't want any more casualties on the battlefield. Wow, that sounded really tough. OK, I'm going to lighten up just a little bit. <laughs> Mental health matters include everything from anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder known as OCD, depression to bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, eating disorders, psychosis, and a host of other diagnoses. Some conditions are genetic, and that's definitely in my case. Others are induced by life circumstances, such as trauma and dysfunction in family and other relationships. My work as a marriage and family therapist involves helping people, people heal from abuse, working through marriage and family relationship challenges, as well as parenting demands. Somebody said one time, you either gave birth to your biggest problem in life, or you married your biggest problem in life. <laughs> Or maybe other people, you th think that you're the biggest problem in their lives. So not as a diss on anybody, but relationships bring out challenges in ourselves and with other people. The good news is making change in your generation, if you have had trauma and dysfunction in your past, literally changes the course of history. Intervention with you frees up all the people downstream, your children, your future posterity. In fact, Elder Christofferson says, challenges are at times and indications of the Lord's trust in you. He can help you directly and through others to deal with what you face. You can become the generation, perhaps the first in your family, where the divine patterns that God has ordained for families truly take shape and bless all the generations after you. Um, I, do, I do see all kinds of clients at my office, and I love it. My youngest client so far has been four years old, and I love doing play therapy. We just get down on the floor and play. And my oldest client has been 70. I honor the courage people have to face the challenges squarely in the, the eye despite their fears. Healing is possible. I see it every day. Reality check. There's no quick fix. There are no silver bullets. But there are answers, and life can get better when you align yourself with principles that govern mental health. You have to take action to facilitate your healing. Depression is the body's emotional signal that says something needs to change. Like when you touch a hot stove, milliseconds, that uh, neuro impulse has gone to the brain and back down to your hand. Remove your hand from the stove. Depression, negative emotion, anxious feelings are all signals to the body that says something needs to change. It's not quite as quick as touching that hot stove. Um, all systems try to remain in balance or homeostasis. So even if it's not healthy. We all want things to stay the same. So when you get those signals, listen to them. Ask, what is my body telling me? Am I pushing too hard? Am I not trying enough? Am I expecting too much? Am I expecting too little? Are there people that are unhealthy in my life that I need to change association with? Do I need a different major? Do I need a different job? All of those things, listen, and your heart will tell you. 
There is a type of depression connected to sin. It's the feeling of hopelessness that we've gone too far, that we've done too much, and that we are beyond the reach of God's tender forgiveness. Let me speak clearly about this. Guilt is a healthy God-given emotion to help us change. Shame is not. Guilt says, I made a mistake. Shame says, I am a mistake. Guilt says, I did something bad. Shame says, I am bad. Again, there is hope. It's called change. It's called repentance. Satan would bind you with cords of hopelessness. Christ will break those bands. Satan would make you think nothing can ever change. It's been this way forever. I am too stuck in this problem or this addiction. It has such power over me. I could never change. Christ says, I will help you change. He says, I have paid the price for that. I've asked my husband to come and help me for just a minute as we talk about uh, those of you who may have come home early from a mission. It was our privilege to help our missionaries who needed to return home early for a variety of reasons um, to have a good feeling about their service as missionaries. Um, President and I call these young people our heroes. And President, what wisdom do you have to share? Do I get two minutes? I'm timing. Ready, okay. go. Okay. <laughs> First off, I wanted to say that uh, near the end of our mission, as we were re getting ready for the day, Sister Dimmick looked at me and she said, you know, depression has really been my friend. That got my attention. It has allowed me opportunities that I would not have had. I've been able to help people. She's taught at BYU and BYU-Idaho. Um, and, and then to serve in her calling uh, in the mission field, said it has opened doors for me that I would not have had. That was an interesting paradigm shift. Prior to going, I taught mission prep here and uh, I also taught uh, Book of Mormon for return missionaries. I saw several who came home early and I noticed the shame, the guilt that was there. In fact, devastating for some of them and uh, after we got our call, I just uh, vowed that I would not let our missionaries come home unprepared and not knowing uh, the great missionaries that they are. And so we did a lot as we worked with them, and then when it became obvious that to get better, they needed to return home uh, to prepare them and to let them know. Uh, section uh, 124, verse 49 where those who started to build the Kirtland Temple went to with full intention and enemies came upon them and the Lord says, you don't have to. I accept your offering. We used that scripture. These missionaries came out with the full intent to serve 18 months or two years. And in some cases, it was very quickly they discovered because of the stress of the mission field that their... Uh, their health was not where it needed to be. We did everything to help them. But finally, there comes a point where for them and for their companion and for the mission, it's best that they return home. Now the church has what they call reassignment, where you can be reassigned uh, on a service mission and be able to finish. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful program. We didn't have that. But uh, much as Abraham, who went to the mount fully intending to offer Isaac. But when he got there, the Lord says, I have a different sacrifice. I accept the fact that you would have given Isaac, but I need you to do this. That's our return missionaries. They came, they gave everything that they could, and the Lord says, I accept. As if you served the whole time. That was their heart. That was what they wanted to do. And the Lord says, I accept it. And so our, our, they really are our heroes. We make no uh, difference between those that were able to finish full time and those that were not. 
uh, we encourage their state presidents to allow them to speak in sacrament meeting, to report to high council, and in every way, they are a return missionary. There's, as Elder Holland said, there's no but. Uh, you're a return missionary. And uh, we've been to their weddings and uh, other things, and it's just such a joy. They are our missionaries. They're a missionary to the Lord. Thank you, President. So let's talk about solutions. If you just need a quick fix, if you're just in a little, <clears throat> a little slump, <clears throat> excuse me, um, do something different. Take a break. Go for a walk. Talk to a friend. Cook something yummy. Clean up your apartment. There's the mission president's wife talking to you right now. <laughs> Sometimes just cleaning out your physical space helps you clean out emotionally, helps give you that hope. Um, do yoga. It's a wonderful mind, body, spirit connection. Generate endorphins uh, with whatever exercise you can make your do, yourself do. It's one of the best and f most free natural antidepressants on the market. Try new things. We have a need for psycho new psychological experiences. Maybe read a different genre of books, or maybe read a book. <laughs> Try a new hobby. I like to say, find what floats your boat and take the ride. I love nature. It connects me almost more than anything else with a sense of my real identity. Um, mental illness thrives on isolation. So reach out, reach up, talk to someone, a trusted friend, your bishop, your, fr your parents. Get fresh perspectives, new ideas, someone who help you look at things from a different point of view. If these tips are not enough, seek professional help. Um, there are resources here on campus and a host of help in our community. I have the greatest respect for my clients who come in and say, what I'm doing is not working. I need help. And we dig deep and we go to work. Um, Studies show that, that therapy is helpful and medication can be helpful, but the best outcomes are when a person has both changing the way they're thinking and processing their life as well as medication. So keep that as, as an option. Um, learn, study. Isaiah chapter 5 says, My people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Satan wants us to isolate, to shut down, to stop seeking for help. Now, the last section here is how to help. Um, I went canyoneering, crazy things, but a few years ago, and I hit the wall, metaphorically. Um, <laughs> got into a point with my husband and four sons and our, our canyoneering guide where I just could not do it. It was 105 degrees. We were wearing heavy wetsuits because we were swimming through pools in these slot canyons with dead floating frogs and and it, I know it doesn't this sound fun and after like seven hours of this I was just like I can't do this and I, I literally broke down and my nephew Keith and I were face to face and he said what's the worst possible thing and I said that I'm ruining this trip for these four teenage boys and he said and so what well I could ruin it even more and he said and how are you solving this? Well, they're helping me out through all of this. And he said, that's a bad thing. And I said, no, they're actually quite self-focused boys. So it's probably really good that they're helping me. And, <laughs> and <laughs> Keith worked me through this meltdown, literally. And my husband stayed far away. He was like, OK, Keith's handling her. This is good. <laughs> we need people like that in our lives who can get face to face with us, call us out on our garbage, and help us move past it. We finished that hike, we dropped some more slots, we repelled through some scary distances, and it ended in Cathedral Canyon, which is a 75-foot drop, free-falling through the air. And I screamed the whole way and landed in another pool with dead frogs. How's that? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, have a sense of humor. I'm going to end with where I began, with enthusiasm with God's spirit inside you, you can do this. You cannot conquer darkness with darkness. You must choose light. Satan seeks that all men might be miserable like unto himself. And if you are in a dark, hopeless place, you need to find light. And wherever there's light, there are true principles 
that govern your recovery. Satan wants us to feel hopeless and miserable. For some, he tempts them to rob, steal, and plunder. For others, he gets them to think, I'm just not good enough. I can never get over this. This is hopeless. Pray that you can find a larger perspective. And I end with a quote by Elder Joseph B. Worthlin, a very gentle soul. He said, we see ourselves in terms of yesterday and today. Our Heavenly Father sees us in terms of forever. Although we might settle for less, he won't, for he sees us as glorious beings we are capable of becoming. As one who has been in and through the trenches of mental illness for many years, and now on the other side, hopefully helping people, I bear my solemn witness that there is healing, there is hope, there is joy. Reach out and you will find help. And this is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.